how limited animation gives older cartoons a unique aesthetic. Many animated films today have 24 frames per second, and with the wide range of computer programs and the large budget that major studios such as Disney, Pixar or DreamWorks have, it's not that surprising that they managed to produce so many films with fast, flashy and colourful animation, and with a much longer runtime than some of their older works. But this wasn't always the case. Animation sometimes had to be more limited due to factors such as budget or technology. But does that reduce the quality though? Well, let's see. Now the first question you may have is, what is limited animation? Well, according to some sites, it's the reuse of character animation frames. Now, the credibility of Wikipedia is debatable, I mean, they even say to themselves. But most sources state that it's simply techniques to reduce the number of individual frames drawn. Examples of these techniques include, but are not limited to, reusing character animation frames, mirror images, having only one character moving at a time, looping animations, and rotoscoping. There are many animation studios that have existed for years and are still booming today, but amongst all those there's some which are lost to time, such as the United Productions of America, or UPA for short. This studio was founded by former Disney animators who left in the 1941 animator strike. This studio had a different style. They didn't want to go for the more realistic animation style of Disney, they wanted a more freestyle animation, unlike other studios at the time. And this leads to some quite unique styles of animation. These are clips from UPA's 1949 short film, The Magic Fluke. As you can see, the animation is quite limited. The moves are not very smooth, there's a lot of repetition, it feels but it feels super jumpy and unique, which is the exact look and feel that UPA were going for. Magic Fluke was a moderate success, and along with 1948's Robin Hoodlum, were Oscar nominated, but UPA's real rise to fame was when they introduced their iconic, for the time, character of Mr. Magoo. Several films featuring him ended up winning an Oscar for Best Short Subject, and it was also in the 1950s where the studio won another Oscar for their cartoon Gerald McBoing Boing. Around this time, the UPA limited animation style started to inspire some of the largest studios such as Disney or Hanna-Barbera to experiment more with their animation style. Now, Disney's had lots of, um, you know, different styles over the many years because they've lasted for an extremely long time. Some of their styles include the rotoscoping of early films, such as Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, the sketchy style involving Xerox with the, most of the films during the 1960s and 70s, such as the Aristocats, um, mixing CGI with hand-drawn animation, which was common during the Disney Renaissance, and of course, full 3D animation. So as you can see, Disney doesn't have much of a consistent identity because it's been just around for so long. However, Hanna-Barbera has only lasted for 44 years, and so has managed to maintain a more similar style, at least compared to many other animation studios. But now let's talk about not only Hanna-Barbera's most famous cartoon, but one of the most well-known cartoon franchises of all time, Scooby-Doo. Right. Now obviously there are many different versions of Scooby-Doo, all of uh, varying levels of quality, but the one I want to focus on is Scooby-Doo Where Are You, which ran from 1969 to 1978 for 41 episodes, kind of. Now, I think this show is a prime example of how limited animation was able to morph into one of the most successful cartoon franchises ever made. There are a lot of examples of them reusing character movements, but if anything, this makes it a lot more iconic. Like, the way that the characters run around makes Scooby-Doo, well, Scooby-Doo in, in a weird sort of way. Also, the backgrounds really make the foreground pop out, as they are clearly in separate layers. They're usually less brightly coloured, so it's often sort of trying to show the audience what they should focus on. So if an object doesn't blend in with the background, it sort of hints to the audience that it'll be important. 
Also, the dull backgrounds can represent like the bleak and eerie nature of the locations, and the colourful characters represent hope and truth, unlike in some later editions where everything is more colourful. But with advances in technology, is there still a place in the modern day for limited animation? I would say, yes. A lot of films will deliberately mimic the older animations with lower frame rates. One example is the Sony animated film Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. The majority of the film is animated in 24 frames per second, but Miles, the protagonist, is animated with only 12 frames at the start to indicate how he's unfamiliar with his role as Spider-Man. But throughout the film, his frame rate slowly increases until it's the same as everyone around him. As he becomes more confident with himself as Spider-Man, his frame rate increases. But this film was no easier to animate than ones which have high frame rates all round. It had 177 animators, which is like triple the amount that most animated films have. And this may have been, you know, because the film had quite a unique aesthetic, trying to look like a comic book, giving it a choppier, more jittery aesthetic, as well as having the characters jump unrealistically between positions. So it would seem that in some cases, limited animation isn't being lazy or budget saving, as some films will go out of their way to replicate an older limited style. But should we really be calling it limited animation? For example, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse's visual effects um, team calls it stepped animation rather than limited. Similarly, former Disney background and layout artist John Hubley, who was the creator of UPA's Mr. Magoo, preferred the term stylized. This is likely because it made the movements feel more free, ironically making it less limited. It didn't have to adhere to the normal laws of physics and it was able to immerse you into a completely different world. Also, limited animation is something that I've even experimented with, with my uh, many animations, so hopefully me and some other early animators may help to keep the limited animation alive. Thanks for watching. Links to the sources of information and the list of films I've taken footage from are in the description.